Welcome to the Ocular Surface Academy podcast, TFOS Dues 2 edition. Join us as we meet with the researchers behind this landmark international consensus. Each episode will feature practical clinical takeaways. Before we get to today's episode, here's a quick word from our sponsor. The Sustain iLux system is a device designed to treat patients with meibomian gland dysfunction or MGD. It is the leading cause of dry eye. Dry eye is caused by deficiencies in the quantity and quality of mybum or other tear components within the tear film. Around 30 million people are estimated in the United States to suffer from dry eye symptoms. According to a study, 86% of dry eye sufferers are reported to have clinical signs of meibomian gland dysfunction. Healthy meibomian glands produce clear and liquid mybum. Dysfunctional glands produce mybum that is either cloudy or thick and paste-like. In some cases, the glands do not express any mybum when compressed. This may indicate fully blocked, capped, or damaged glands. The Cystane Ilux system allows eye care professionals to target dysfunctional glands and improve signs and symptoms of MGD using localized heat followed by compression therapy. To clear the glands, the eye care professional positions the Cystane Ilux device on the eyelid and applies light-based heat to melt the mybum. Compression of the lids after heat therapy allows the eye care professional to express the unhealthy mybum. When the blockage is cleared from the unhealthy glands and or clear, healthy mybum is seen on the lid margin. The procedure is complete. Welcome your host and co-host for today's episode of the Ocular Service Academy podcast, Dr. Scott Schachter and Dr. Christopher Starr. Thank you all for joining us today, Sophie Dang, Lyndon Jones. I'm a fan of your work, and apparently now I've got I've learned all new things about you and your your musical career, Chris, as well. And we, we and I'm into music too, but I won't start that whole thing. So we can <laughs> actually talk about uh, how to treat dry eye disease. I think that's why we're on here. But love hearing the stories, and they will make it post real. We're going to throw these on the end of the recording. I think it's super interesting to hear all that stuff. When was Dr. Jones a DJ? When did he retire from DJ? <sighs> how many singles does he have? And um, how many of Chris Starr's photos are real or not? Spot the thing. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you all for joining us. And we're going to talk about management therapy today. And I, I always think, you know, I did a series of, on Demodex blepharitis several years ago with a group of us. And mine was on the diagnosis, or I'm sorry, the management part. And um, it got by far in a way the most, everyone always wants to know, how do I treat it? How do I treat it? And Chris and I had the pleasure of talking with Dr. Priya Gupta last week. And she described it this way, sort of the, the chaos of dry eye disease. You know, you've got this multifactorial disease state. There are all sorts of diagnostics and there are all sorts of therapeutics. And how do doctors approach that? And what I love about this and what I've always preached, and I'm sure you've done the same, is there is this framework that exists for you to base it all off of. So, Dr. Deng, welcome from UCLA, correct? Yes, UCLA Stein Eye Institute. And also running as a trustee for Arvo, so we wish you luck with that. And Dr. Jones at Waterloo. Uh, where are you from originally, Lyndon? I'm originally from uh, just outside of Cardiff in South Wales. Okay, very good. And Chris, thank you again. Always uh, the author of the Ask Chris algorithm. Uh, love having Chris uh, join us as usual. And um, who wants to kick us off with uh, share this approach to management of or treatment of dry eye disease? And I'll have to ask my burning question right off the bat. This is a stepwise approach. And in the original dry workshop took a stage, not staged, it was matched. So it matched severity. Your level two, we're going to approach level two. This was stepwise. And what was behind the change in philosophy there? So, so that was actually one of the challenges that we were set. And it's interesting you, you talk about that sort of chaotic it concept around dry eye, because it, it really is. I mean, it's if you look at the stuff that was around in 2007 when Deuce, Deuce 1 came out, it really was a case of, okay, let, let's try and work out how it is that we both diagnose dry eye and then manage it. But it was it was much more around the sort of research area, I think. One of the things that we were charged with for TFOS Deus 2 was to try and make it much more practical. How can we ensure that an everyday clinician can um, sensibly diagnose a patient with dry eye and ideally try and characterize whether they are more aqueous deficient or uh, evaporative? 
or mixed, and if mixed, where they are on that scale, to then within our committee, the one that Sophie and I were on, which was basically uh, the management therapy, we were given two things. One, do an evidence-based review of everything that's out there. And whilst that took time, it was still relatively easy to do. The challenge was exactly what you just asked, which is about how do you then map that onto the patient? So we've diagnosed the patient. We now know which therapies work. How do you decide how to, to map them? And so we looked at the original concept, that sort of staged area, and, and there really wasn't any great evidence around trying to map all of the management therapies onto a patient using that staged approach, which is why we had the stepwise approach. Start simple and then go to the more complicated areas. Don't think that they're mutually exclusive because that was kind of, I think, how the staged approach had worked. And so we wanted people to get away from that. So that, that's why we did that stepwise approach. Yes, I totally agree. I think that the dry eye is so complex and each patient comes with different kind of presentation. One patient maybe has more component of increased deficiency and then another patient may have more component of MGD and they always together and you just have to, you know, treat both of them, but you focus on one maybe more than the other one. And patients have busy life, especially in the LA, they don't come here and, you know, just, just for nothing. And they come to us already, they're pretty severe at time. So our patient population are also a little different. They have seen maybe two or three, maybe up to six doctors already. And, and by the time they come to us, they want a miracle to like, this cure me. And I'm suffering from this dry eye. So for those patients, we have a tailor to their lifestyle and also what treatment has been like have been already done on them but they are not working and based on all of those and come up with a plan for this particular patient so I agree totally I mean the step one to step four are very good general guidelines but sometimes you have to pick and choose from maybe go for step four some of them really severe joy I like graph versus whole disease I have a much lower threshold to do a you know, permanent uh, permanent conclusion, like cauterization. And then the patient come in, that's the first evaluation. Of course, you don't do permanent inclusion of a puncture at the first visit. So really, this is exactly so complex. And I think that customized treatment is the key yeah. for this patient. Yeah, and that's one of the things that the TFAS 2s report was so careful about saying is like, there. yes, the, the, we're giving you an algorithm and we're giving you this stepwise rubric to, to sort of generally follow, but these patients are so complicated, there's no way that one you know, faithful algorithm, algorithmic process is gonna work for every patient. So here's a general framework, do what you gotta do, you know, and, and treat your patients appropriately because you know, uh, there's just no one process for all patients, clearly, especially those more co complex patients. One of the things that struck me about the report, you know, is this, you had to classify the evidence as level one, level two, level three evidence. And that can be tricky to go through, to sort through all the literature and make those judgments. And what struck me was how little level one evidence yeah. there actually is for things that we kind of take for granted. And one being artificial tears. <laughs> can you tell me a little bit about that process and how arduous that was and, and whether or not there was any controversy around some of those decisions and how'd that go? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question, Chris. It, it was, you know, it's one of those things where whenever you start doing any of these reviews, you think, well, that'll be easy. I'll go in yeah. and, you know, there'll, there'll, there'll be definite evidence to support that. And then you look <laughs> and you look again, you think, okay, this is, this is crazy. And actually one of the things that I think that TFOS in all of its reports, whether it be the contact lens discomfort report or the MGD report or TFOS DUS2, is it's been really good at throwing up those. There's a gap here. There's a gap here that somebody needs to fulfill. And if you look at the amount of publications that occur after every one of those TFOS reports, it totally takes off because it really does kind of awaken people as to where the gaps are. And you, you bang on, Chris, the lack of level one evidence around the treatment of dry eye has been frightening. But now if you look, we were very fortunate on contactlensupdate.com to have um, Jenny Craig recently do a what's changed since TFOS DUS2 was published. And one of the things that she calls out is the number now of new 
very well controlled. Um, so RCTs that have happened since that as a result of TFOS News 2 saying there's a gap here. You know, we 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 don't have that evidence. So yeah. Right. Exactly. I think that TFOS is really have a leader this field in a way that you look in the evidence base, right? Well, at this time everything everybody asks them, where is the evidence, right? And it's good when we, uh, I think it's so challenging when we have like uh, all the committee members sitting here like, well, this everybody does, but there's no evidence showing that actually one is better than the other. But this, I think that this way also paved the way for the agencies, regardless from the government agencies versus from the industry. I think then they see the need to support a better I and mean, well-designed clinical trial to look into how should we treat these people? Like, and then instead of like, oh, my experience from X and Y number of patients seem to work. This is really poor in terms of uh, the evidence out there. I'm very really excited actually when you look at this uh, report. And even so, it's really challenging at the times. Like, oh, sh- how should we make this recommendation? Because there's no evidence, well, strong evidence out there supporting what we are recommending. But that's the experience, right, from uh, you know, from the uh, community. But now, I think going forward, the next five, ten years, I'm sure the landscape is going to change based on the report uh, that published here. I think I'm really excited to to see the field is moving forward. Which which of your were any of your recommendations in this in the steps one through four resoundingly easy to endorse? You came across an abundance of high-level research and valid studies with a lot of value that you could unequivocally say, this is something you should be doing. On reflection, I think probably one of the ones that had the highest number of RCTs conducted were actually on the use of steroids. So there there were several well-conducted studies looking at steroids. I think because it was typically, okay, you know, there are going to be some downsides to this. This needs to be done in a very well-controlled manner. The thing that really surprised us on the other end, and, and Chris has already mentioned it, is lubricants. You know, topical lubricants, there was one well controlled study. That's ridiculous. When you think of the number of years we've had drops, that's crazy. And there, there have been some more recently, you know, things that you, you, you really can't do on, uh, again, Sophie mentioned it about things like punctal occlusion. It's really hard to do a mass control study on punctal occlusion. So, you know, it, almost impossible to be able to do that, particularly if you're uh, truly occluding it. So there are some of the treatments that make it quite difficult to do, things like evacuation of the meibomian glands. You know, how do you do a sham procedure on that without warming the lid and evacuating? Yes, you could warm it, not evacuate it, I guess. So there's, there's elements of it, but some of these studies really don't lend themselves to level one study. So that was why some of them were missing, but some of them were just because people are gone, ah, I don't need to do that. I know it works. And again, Sophie's just, it's great, Sophie's little comment about, I've done this for years, it works. That doesn't work. You know, evidence-based medicine these days, that does not cut it, mate. So, uh, you know, Stop, stop that. And I think that's, again, one of the things that TFOS has been really good at doing is saying, that's not going to, you got to do the study properly. And I think that in addition, it's like the devices now, like there's so many more that people yeah. claim that, okay, from certain patients that work and then, but there's no control the comparison. I think now it just raised the bar is that even so it cannot be completely masked, but at least you have select, you know, the same patient population and yeah. and compare the efficacy from uh, between like a month different devices now, not just two, right? Between two devices, and I think that will help and to have a better guideline in the uh, in the future, like in this condition, for example, NGD, which gray, and then which device will be more beneficial than the other one, and worse wise. So I think that's so much, many more questions raised that. And uh, the answer that we provide in a way, but it's a great, it means a guideline and people just just follow these different options, medical treatment uh, versus the uh, physical treatment, expression of um, mebomic gland versus the uh, steroids and versus punctual inclusion. And I think that here, at least they give this something to follow. I think this is a great starting point. 
Yeah, one of the interesting things about this subcommittee was that it is kind of intimately tied to the clinical trial design subcommittee as well. And because as you read through the management and all of this evidence for various treatments, you realize, at least for us in the United States, that we do not have access to a lot of things that are well-established and, and proven in clinical trials in other places. And two of the big ones from the report were di diclofosol, like uh, sec secretagogues, basically, mucin and, and aqueous secretagogues, diclofosol and rabamipide, which in Asia and Japan and other places, they're using them with great success. And those all failed clinical trials in, in the United States, and, and we don't have access to them. And there are plenty of other failed trials that we all know of in the U.S. And, you know, of course, the clinical trials subcommittee said, well, there, here are all the problems with clinical trials. And here's and, and TFOS is trying to help everybody with clinical trial design and, and by creating this definition and this process and this algorithmic and objective data for endpoints and so on and so forth, that hopefully going forward, we can, if people all sort of follow these sort of guidelines, we'll get more things approved. And, 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 and I think in the few years since TFOS does too, there actually have been more <laughs> approvals, probably in large part, thanks to the, the efforts of, of you and, and, and TFOS and the report. Yeah, and I think also the linkage with the diagnostic committee as well, because you yes. know, as, as Sophie just said, it, it, you you can have a whole load of people who get entered into these trials, and they're never going to be successful. And this trial group is not the same as this trial group. So, yes. so that diagnostic criteria again plays very much into this. So, th that was again one of the nice things about the TFOS these two process was that that interlinkage between so many of the committees actually really helps drive everything forward. So, you know, there, there is, I don't know, a lot of people, you know, really want to hear from the management therapy committee, but really we're fairly irrelevant unless the people who are doing the diagnosing diagnose people appropriately and then use appropriate methods for developing the trials to get the stuff approved. So that that, that linkage and, and overlap is really important too. Yeah. You know, step one is education. I'm looking at it now, modification of local environment, education regarding dietary modifications, uh, eliminating potential offenders like systemic and topical medications, ocular lubricants, and lid hygiene and warm compresses. Anything in these steps one through four that you have moved around in your own practices, you jump in with a step two therapy in step one, maybe you're writing a prescription in step one. Have you, do you follow these guidelines pretty closely or how have you modified your own approach since TFOS 2 is two? I think step one is really important. Being to find out why the patient might have the dry eyes first place, because patients have a, well, in LA, we have a lot of blepharoplasty patients, okay? So this is pretty unique to LA, so we have to understand. And they, they have often the patient don't think that it's a surgery. So when they ask them, can we have an eye surgery? I say no. And then after you look at the patient for a while, it's like, this is lack of Belmos, the patient is not playing, and then the face is so tied up, and it's like, it can be. I um, said, so have I had an eyelid surgeon? Oh, yeah, I had like two years ago. Ever since then, my eyes are bother me. So <laughs> it's so important to understand the history of this patient, and this is from exposure. Once it, you identify the cause or the main cause uh, of this problem, then you can address it appropriately, correctly. Otherwise, then the patient will continue to have problems, right? Because artificial tears will not be sufficient. And this patient needs to have a punctal flux, nine ointment, and even tape the ID shut in order for them to uh, improve. So I think I, I think it's that one absolutely important to to as a starting point to make a correct diagnosis and then start the appropriate treatment. And I, I totally agree that with the step one approach. It was well an, an, again, great question, Scott, because one of the things that we we struggled with as a committee, you know, when we were doing the first part of the report, which was the evidence base, that the, you know, there was some argument about, well, is this really level one or level two? But, you know, no one lost friends. There was no blood spill. <laughs> Not quite the same when it came to the algorithm. 
there it was, you know, there, there was definitely some arguing about, well, no, 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 that's that should definitely be in step two. And I think if you look at, at a lot of things between step one and step two, quite a few of those things could be, you know, interchanged between the two. And and it it would have been a very easy merge. It's almost like a step one slash two. So I think those are a lot of people could actually take stuff from step two and, and start when they first start seeing a patient with dry eye. Three and four, I think, are, are quite different. I, I, I wouldn't suggest that necessarily any of those, unless patient's pretty severe, would be something that I would start with. But the, I, I think for us, the step thing, step one part was this could be done as primary care. This is not necessarily severe dry eye within a, a regular routine practice don't miss patients who've got dry eye, you know, just, uh, you know, whether it be before you start contact lens wear or within your routine practice. I think typically we tend to think historically of patients have to have lots of symptoms and they'll tell us if they think they've got dry eye as opposed to us looking for them. I think, you know, there is a lot of patients who have early dry eye that are are not necessarily symptomatic, they're they're pre-symptomatic. So, Take an opportunity to look at a patient w- within your, your primary care and things like advice about education and nutrition and, you know, having a locally placed humidifier, something very, very simple. Very recently, you know, the, the use of masks has definitely produced more people with dry eye. This, this mask-associated dry eye or mask-induced dry eye is certainly something that we're seeing lots and mo- lots more in clinical practice. And, you know, patients coming in, they don't put those two things together. And so hopefully people will ask patients about whether they have any symptoms and will look for those and then use those sort of step one, step two type procedures to prevent it getting worse. So prevention being much, much better than, than cure in my mind. Yeah, that's, you know, that's a great point too. When you look at steps one through four, you know, I'm going to guess in my own practice that a probably a good 90% of my patients are managed with step one and two. Yeah. I think you take a big leap in severity to start reaching for these other things like autologous serum, amniotic membrane. Those are going to be recalcitrant patients. And the, and the step one and two, which may be patients are doing one and two, uh, combinations of both. What do you find that that's what, I don't know what setting you're in exactly, but what about all three of you? Would you agree that in your practices, that's the lion's share of what you're seeing? Yeah, I, I would say so. Um, you know, I, in, in Manhattan, uh, New York city, you know, obviously there are lots of ophthalmologists in a small area. And so I, I do tend to see a lot of, as Sophie was saying earlier, a lot of second, third, and fourth opinions. And so, so the, a lot of the patients who will come to see me for the first visit are already kind of at a stage two, two or three, right? They've, they've already done all the simple stuff and the artificial tears and warm compresses, lid hygiene, mega threes, whatever it may be. And so I will, uh, you know, I would say the majority of the patients I see for the first time for dry eye disease or ocular surface disease will be started at a level two or higher treatment by me because they've already failed or, or step one wasn't enough. So immunomodulator is something that, you know, it's almost in my book is a st- step one drop and you know, like a corticosteroid might be a step more appropriate for step two. But a lot of the patients I'll see will be getting all of those things at the first visit because they're suffering and they've failed artificial tears. And plugs, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm based at the university and I primarily work in the contact lens clinic. So most, most of my patients are, you know, fairly fairly early dry eye patients because they're, they're wearing contact lenses. So, and, and I think that's one of the things that, again, we were, we, we really hope that the report gets across is to the contact lens fraternity, because even the best contact lens and contact lens solution is not going to work well if the ocular surface isn't healthy. And I think we, we tend to forget that, you know, whenever a patient's coming in with contact lens discomfort, you think, okay, so what can I change? I can change the lens. I can change the solution. I can change the frequency of replacement they forget the patient. You know, they, they really don't think about not necessarily changing the patient, but changing the ocular surface and making sure that ocular surface is healthy. So I think, you know, for me, most of mine would be the earlier stage ones just because of the environment that I work in. Quite different, I think, to, uh, to, to St- Sophie and Chris. And you, and you talk, Lyndon, about something that I always described myself in the past as a brand chaser or modality chaser as opposed to 
fix the eye first approach. And, and you know, I think my opinion, you've, re- you've really got to optimize the surface of the eye in addition to contact lens design and materials and solutions and modality, et cetera. Otherwise you're looking at, this is why contact lens dropout rates haven't changed in the last 20 years, despite massive investment by industry to give us, to, to reduce that rate, it hasn't budged in 20 years. So you, in your clinic, really assess these patients prior. Do you get a sense that your dropout rates are a lot lower than perhaps a typical practice? I don't know if they're a lot lower. I think what tends to happen is um, because we're in a research-based environment, then maybe we, you know, we we will be more more inclined to move people forward into newer technology and look at the ocular surface as well. So um, maybe the dropout rates are, are lower, but I also tend to think we probably, compared with the community, tend to get a lot of people who just like you guys get the the dry eye dregs we get the contact lens dregs you know the, the, the people who come to us are the more complex contact lens patients because they've been elsewhere as opposed to the simple the, the simple fit so we do get some university students but a lot of our patients are fairly complex patients as well and and great point scott about dropouts rates really haven't changed they really haven't you know products now are so much better than they were 20 years ago yet dropout rates haven't changed I think what we are seeing is, I, mean, so I, I left the UK 22 years ago, and I was in private practice for 12 years, of a primary care practice prior to that. And I'm seeing my Birmingham gland dysfunction rates now that I've never seen, like in my life. I'm, I'm sure that there's an element of my Birmingham gland dysfunction going up. I don't think it's just the fact that we're looking for it more now. I think we, you know, I, we're seeing teenagers with my Birmingham gland dysfunction. Now, you know, we never used to see that. It was, it was the older people who got that. And I, I'm wondering whether it's this digital device world that we're in now that may be driving that. There is some evidence starting to surface now. And I worry about that. I worry about the number of kids who are seven, eight, nine, who are, they're showing dropout. I mean, that's not, that's not good well, let, moving forward. Let me ask you, Lynn, and I, that's a great point. You know, I see a lot of kids that have what I call a parent dropout. And I, I put it this way. If I see a patient with 0.8 cup, I can't call that glaucoma until I see what? I need to see progression, right? So do we, what, what's really lacking is long-term longitudinal data. Did these patients ever have, when you say they have MGD or dropout, are you saying that you've seen gland loss or you look at their glands and they're not all there? That, exactly what you've just said, that, that we've got younger people who appear to have gland dropout. We don't have the five to 10 years worth of follow-up to show that there is change over time. There are some studies that show changes induced by contact lenses, so pre and post contact lens wear, so that there, there are changes induced in some studies, but even that's equivocal. So you know, I think as the technology gets better and as more people you know, this becomes a routine part of clinical practice. And I think it will. I think that, you know, with the development now of of multi-platform devices that do lots of things, uh, I think mybography and evaluating my Birmingham glands is going to become much more the norm. But you're right, we don't have that. Yep, you know what? We get this dropout in in teenagers. We we need that data. That's another of those things that we just don't have uh, as evidence that's really important. How about you, Sophie? What's what do you think about your in your practice steps one through four? What what do you mostly see? Like for me, most of my patients, like Chris mentioned, they come here. How they have to seen five, six uh, corner specialists. So we we most of them, I you already done one and two. So what left <laughs> are the three and four? Depends on the availability of the uh, medication or, or devices. For example, we don't have the, well, re- very difficult for US is the serum drops because nowadays uh, less and less pharmacies are willing or able to compound the serum drop, making very expensive. So uh, even so that we want to have a uh, patient put uh, them on the serum drops, but it just financially they're not able to afford it. And so we we go for something else. So for example, permanent punctal inclusion, we use a lot uh, for those really, really severe 
disease patient, dry eye patient, and tosorophy. We have had totally very rich dry eye and ex severe exposure. And we would take a long time to educate the patients and, and make sure they understand this is the last thing we can do is just to salvage the eye because the eye is melting from the dry eye. This is a level of, uh, of a dry eye disease sometimes we see here. Uh, we also turn to scroll lens, large di diameter fluid field scroll lens devices. I think it's uh, still underutilized and we're really fortunate that we have an uh, optometrist here who are excellent uh, fitting those patients. So for me, I have to say that half the patient in step three, step four, and other half in step two and three. So for me, um, the patient population is a lot more, you know, uh, have a lot more severe disease. You know, you all, you all bring up something very interesting to me as p practitioners who see, they seek you out because you're, you're experts in your area uh, and in the profession, they seek out your opinion and you say, and I hear what you're saying, a lot of them have done step one and step two, so what's next? So let me ask you, and Sophie, you brought this up earlier, have you had eye surgery? No, well, lid, you didn't say lid surgery, right? So if a patient comes into you and says, I tried restasis, what do you think? I'll tell you what I think later, but I've, I come into you as a patient. I've tried tears. I've tried compresses. I tried restasis. I, I tried all that stuff. None of it worked. How do you, how far do you dig into that fact, that statement? So I think that you have to see how, uh, how long were they on the medication because those medications do burn. <laughs> and if they put one job in, oh, ouch, I don't want to touch it again. And they have not even been on the eye job. Only thing is that they, they could not tolerate medication. Does not mean the medication is ineffective, right? So I think the detailed history is so important on whether they worked or not. And again, if the patient is so symptomatic, and the surface is so inflamed, of course, this medical uh, med medication will not be effective because they just can't tolerate it, right? So you have to go into, well, if this eye is really dry now, what do you do first? And maybe soft on the lens initially, but it's so dry, it could make it worse. And is it time for them to accept to wear a scroll lens? May not be. So for me, I have quite a low threshold to put a pump of box in. Once of the surface improved, information reduced, and then they might be, at the time, they still might need more help. They can put in some of the eye drops, uh, pharmacological eye drops uh, for them to, to further improve their information and the dry eyes. So sometimes I reverse completely is that just based on what the patient looks like, right? And I think there is a combination of all these means, all these medication the treatments and make, make it work uh, eventually. They eventually come back once you uh, treat them aggressively. And one of the big things when it comes to these patients who you do see and they say, I've, I've tried everything, nothing's worked. Well, then the question is, you know, do you, you, you use all these dry eye medications to treat dry eye, but do you actually have dry eyes? And a lot of these patients, they just don't. They have something, some other ocular surface disease or dysfunction that is not being treated in, uh, and their symptoms persist. So my first question is, well, what are, exactly are your symptoms? What bothers you the most about your eyes? How long did you use Restasis? You know, oh, I used it for a couple of days. Oh, okay. That's, and then and then three, you know, I run my, pro, my protocol, objective measurements, diagnostic tests, my exam. And I'm like, oh, well, you actually have allergies. That's why Restasis didn't work and the artificial tears didn't work. Or you have floppy eyelid syndrome or you have EBMD or whatever it is. I mean, there are a zillion things that are possibilities, but it's, you know, that's my trigger to, to kind of look for probably something else in addition to dry eye or other than dry eye. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's, you know, often it's misdiagnosis. And then if it's not misdiagnosis, it's poor compliance. You know, yeah. patients, patients are just absolutely rubbish at doing what you tell them. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm just as bad. I have terrible blepharitis, like terrible blepharitis. I've had it for years. It's now starting to impact my contact lens where, so I'm kind of driven now to do something about it, but I'm still terrible. And, you know, I should know better, but, um, it, it's it's tough, you know. It, it, having to put drops in multiple times a day, having to clean your lids multiple times, 
it's a pain. You know, people want a one one off fix. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges with with dry eye is the, the, it, it's and, and I say to, to people, uh, you know, that education around dry eye, I think is really important. Blepharitis and dry eye is a bit like having kids. It's a disease that's with you for life. It <laughs> never goes away. You just manage it. And, and and it's really hard, I think, to get people to appropriately manage their dry eye. You, you can be the best diagnostician, the best prescriber, but if they don't do their part, it ain't going to work. Well, you should be excited about, I have blepharitis as well. You should be excited about uh, the Tarsus innovation. That looks quite promising. Their medication uh, currently in clinical trials looks, I think you use it for seven weeks or something and it lasts for about a year. So I'm very excited about that. And, and Lyndon, you know, you lead me to the next point, compliance burden, right? There are so many things that I think are exciting You know, Darista, for example, uh, to spare the ocular surface to provide glaucoma treatment. Is that something you've had experience with yet, Chris? No, no, I have not. But the idea that you can inject a a drop of a PGA into the anterior chamber and spare the ocular surface and take away compliance burden, which which leads me to step two. So you you have a patient come in, you make some, some lifestyle changes, you do nutraceuticals, artificial tears check them back. Uh, when, when do you all check those patients back? If you see a step one, when do you typically see them back? I think that if they're not severe, not, if the cone is not melting, sometimes we do see people, cone are melting because the severe dry eyes. If not those, normally about a month, two months, if we put them on like with stasis, Zydra, and it takes, you know, a month, two months for them to work anyway. So when they're not too severe, maybe um, a couple months later, how about you, Lynn? Yeah, I mean, I'll see them in a month, if only because I just want to check they're doing what I've told them to do. You know, and the number of times they come in and you'll say, right, so you're doing this, this, and this. Oh, I'm not not, not doing quite that. So, you know, what I don't want to do is leave it for three months and then have been doing something wrong for three months, or they just get bored and fed up because it's not working. So I will see them in sort of somewhere between two and four weeks just to check up how they're going. Um, and then I'll see them when I'm thinking there may be, or I would be expecting some change, whether it be in symptoms or signs. Um, and if I'm not seeing anything, then, you know, the one thing about dry eye management is you've got to be pretty fleet of foot. You've got to be prepared to go, that's not working. I've got to try something else as opposed to just going, oh, well, it'll, it'll get better. You know, just, just keep going with that. It'll get better. Cause even if it, it, it a if it is going to get better, the compliance is likely not going to be there because if it's not if it's not dealing with their symptoms, there's no better way of getting a patient to do something than to have their symptoms go away. And if it doesn't go away, then you know it, it's tough for them to keep going. And that's one of the problems I think with with you know things like restasis is you can keep saying to them all you want. You just got to keep going with it. It's going to take, you know, several months for that to happen. Yeah, but I need, I want, I want something now. I mean, that's why any of these newer managements that kick in a lot quicker are going to be much more helpful for our patients. And, and moving forward, you know, anything that takes four to eight weeks, people can live with that. Four to eight months, that's that's a tough call for them. Well, that's, that's what's so great about what I was going to get to eventually here was these in-office procedures that we can yeah. use. So, so anytime that we can have something done to us to take away that compliance burden. I mean, as a patient, sign me up. You know, if I don't have to do hot compresses and I can do some sort of my bony and gland evacuation and that can relieve my signs and symptoms, then I'm all in. So talk a little bit about the procedures, um, my bony and gland expression, IPL, you know, those things that we can do to patients. How is the evidence there? How, how much do you utilize those yourselves? Well, I will say with procedures, I, I'm a big fan of them. I think in the TFOS News 2 report there, I'm not sure how much level one evidence there really was uh, for it, but you guys can speak more to that than I can. But, uh, but one of the things that uh, what I, I usually don't do with my patients who I do procedures on is say, you don't need to do warm compresses anymore. And, you know, the daily regimen, I usually say, you still have to do these things, lid hygiene, uh, you know, warm compresses, et cetera, but they will probably be more effective if we do this procedure. And you'll probably, you know, not, you have a little bit of leeway uh, and they, they will be more effective if we can kind of un- get the glands kind of running again and, and evacuated and 
kind of back to a baseline, healthy baseline state. And then you perpetuate that with your daily activity rather than saying, I'm going to do this procedure. You don't need to do anything for a year. And then we'll repeat it in a year. And, you know, that I, I just don't think it works that well. I think that that whole concept around doing in-office procedures is not only growing, it's going to continue to grow. I think there's going to be a lot more companies developing those. I think exactly what you said, Scott, about I, I, I think giving that kickstart in the practice and then getting people to do the stuff at home, like, like Chris was saying, makes a lot of sense. And I think there is now, when, when we did the 2017 report, there was really only a little bit of evidence around Lipiflow. There's been more evidence since that it works. Now we've had ILUX as well. So, you know, handheld device. Again, a couple of, of well-controlled studies looking at showing how that works as well. IPL now at least two well-controlled studies that show, again, that it does work. Not not for everybody, but in the majority of people, it, it does work. I think there are certain patients for whom it, it won't work. And we don't yet know, you know, how do you pick this patient for whom it's going to work versus this one that it doesn't. So, you know, if it doesn't work for that patient, it's a hundred percent no. But but there is evidence um, now, I think, from from well controlled studies that it does work. What we don't have is a known treatment paradigm for how to do IPL. So you know, what's the fluency rate? How often should it be done? So that's where I think we do need to work. And then there's other things like Zocular. You know, the, so the in office procedures again that are just cleaning up the lids nicely. Um, I think are, are beginning to work pretty well. So I think there are more options now than there were before, and that's only going to continue. And you'll see, you know, I've got patients and I have all those devices. I've got an Ilux, I have a chair care, I have an IPL, and I use Zocular and all those things. And sometimes we will have patients, and Laura Perriman, a friend and colleague, uh, has done a lot of work on IPL. And what we'll often do is go through three or four sessions of IPL, which has been shown to improve my bone gland function and, and anatomy, and then go with my bone gland expression. We feel like it sets it up a little bit better at that point. Right. Studies are needed for, for sure. And these patients might, might well be, we kicked you off with a steroid to get your, your symptomatic relief quickly. We got the inflammation under control. Then now we're going to get you on a topical immunomodulator long-term. Uh, but we're also going to address my bone and gland dysfunction and ocular rosacea, which we see plenty of by doing IPL and then going on to a lipid flow. And so there, yes, that's a lot of things, but some of these patients are symptomatic enough and showing enough signs that it's really warranted. Yeah. And, and they're miserable people. You know, it's a bit like having, having chronic back pain or, or having chronic pain. They, they, they want any help that they can get. And those, those people are hard to, to manage. And, you know, and that was another thing I think we threw up in, in our report was about neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain really hadn't been addressed in any great area before. Um, there's been a lot more work, I think, since TFOS Dues 2 about how to recognize patients with neuropathic pain, not necessarily what to do with them because they're very difficult to manage. But again, those are often patients for whom, you know, you've thrown everything but the kitchen sink at them and it's not working because that's not really what they've got. Again, coming back to what Chris said, it's that misdiagnosis and the neuropathic pain ones in particular, I think, you know, we need to be aware of and not miss. Well, you, you mentioned chronic back pain, but I think studies actually equated uh, dry disease with angina. I mean, the same level uh, that's been shown in, in research. And, yep. you know, these steps that we talk about, maybe maybe you move off of one, maybe you move to another, maybe maybe it's additional, et cetera, right? These, these can all be, uh, you know, a combination of numerous, numerous of these to, to get relief finally. Yep. And we, we actually say in the report, you know, th these are not mutually exclusive and patients can move from one management group to another as their disease flares up or goes away. So, you know, be don't, don't be locked into the rigidity of that. That was just a, you know, a concept. Be very fluid, be, be, be quite prepared and quite happy to move around. But nonetheless, I think that's a great place to, I mean, this, I actually have this a couple of spots in my practice so that my staff knows what we're doing. We can share it with patients. It's a very easy piece of paper to print out and show. Look, and, and, and when your patients are wondering why you're taking this approach, I like to say, listen, here's this expert consensus. 150 of you brilliant people came together and said, this is what we should do. So I'm going to go based on this framework 
and, and evidence-based medicine with, with dry disease, I think, is everything to bring some organization to the chaos that we all talked about earlier. Certainly, we did a thing. Scott has our paper up in his practice. I do. I do. I'm so we, happy we to it. hear that. <laughs> I've got Chris's paper up in my practice, too. I've got the <laughs> Actually, me too. <laughs> yeah. If I've got patients I'm referring out for cataract surgery, I take a look at that. Absolutely. Right. Chris, any, so anybody cool. else have anything to add? And I want to thank you. We could, I'm sure we could continue for hours, but I think Sophie's waiting on lunch. Uh, but I want to thank you all. Chris, anything else? Anyone, anything else anyone would like to add? You know, I, I, I think we covered this all really well. The only thing I was going to add to the talk about procedurals is that, uh, you know, I find there's a lot of synergy with the, the various procedures. And I think that, um, that you can add them onto each other sometimes. I think, you know, something like a, I, I've always done blepharo exfoliation or blefex along with lippy flow. I just got the ILUX. And in fact, yesterday I had a patient who was so uh, unhappy and so suffering for so long. I actually ended up doing a, a blefex first, then a lippy flow for 12 minutes, and then ILUX afterwards, which I think, you know, is, a, is, is the first time I've ever did all three together in one person. But I think that it, in a lot of ways, it makes a lot of sense to, to do the Blefex first and uncapped the glands and biofilms and all that uh, uncaps the glands and then you do the lipid flow and it's an automated, you know, sort of one stop fits all uh, type of approach. And then afterwards, you know, the ILUX is a little bit more customized and you can get in there and look at each of the glands and you're compressing yourself and evacuating and expressing and doing a little extra heat in those areas that need it. And, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, th I thought that was great and the patient's very happy and I, I can see myself doing a lot more of those kind of customized combo treatments going forward. Yeah, I think we shouldn't be afraid to offer these packages of combined procedures. We don't have to just think, oh my gosh, I don't want to pile too much on there. I mean, I, I, I know that cost is an issue, but that might very well be in their best interest. And as I like to think that we treat these people as if they were our family. So uh, whatever we think is best, and it may very well be a combination. Yeah, totally agree. I think that is not like rigid guidelines here. It's, it is something that offer, this is this is the stepwise approach, but not necessarily we have to finish all step two before we can go to step three or four. Um, you have mismatch and whatever works for this particular patient, combination of many different treatments, I think that will achieve the best outcome. Individualized medicine is definitely the way it's going, isn't it, for sure? And 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 now we have the option. You know, 20 years ago, we didn't have the option with dry eye. It was a case of which of these drops do you want? Here's three, go away and try them. And, you know, hopefully one of them works. It's very different these days. You know, we not only do we have better treatments, but we have better knowledge about both diagnosis and treatment as well. Well, thank you all so much for your time, your expertise, your work towards advancing the science. And we look forward to TFOS 2's 3 from you guys. Hope we're getting going on that pretty soon. Well, thank, thank you for having me. Thanks thank you all again. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Join us for our next episode soon. Find us online at www.ocularsurfaceacademy.com, all major podcast platforms, and YouTube. Acromedics, providing proven dry eye disease treatment options since 1984. Contact us now.